well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. I am so glad that you're with us today. we got to talk about something that uh, has been bugging me throughout the entire election cycle here. It is uh, what I believe to be the most meaningless phrase in politics. I support the Second Amendment. No, you don't. No, you... I mean, listen, obviously not everybody who says I support the Second Amendment is lying, but... Man, there are a lot of people for whom that is the case. Uh, Most recently, uh, uh, Admiral uh, McRaven, uh, William McRaven, who uh, came out at an editorial in the Wall Street Journal today uh, announcing that uh, he has voted for Joe Biden. Uh, He appeared on CNN to uh, to tout his vote for Joe Biden, saying that a Republican is under attack from the president. Uh, in his op-ed, you can see here uh, Jake Tapper quoting it, Truth be told, I am a pro-life, pro-Second Amendment, small government, small defense, and a national anthem standing conservative, but dot, dot, dot. All right, well, listen. This being Baron Arms Cam and Company, we're going to focus only on the claims of supporting the Second Amendment on the part of Admiral William McRaven. Uh, Because for a number of years, Admiral McRaven has been supporting all kinds of gun control laws. And I've I've, I've looked, I have looked, and I have yet to find a statement from uh, William McRaven ever opposing a gun control measure. I have looked for him to come out and say, listen, these uh, bans on assault weapons are stupid, they're unconstitutional. I can't find that statement. What I have found, going back to 2015... Uh, support for restricting the right to keep and bear arms. Back in 2015, William McRaven was the chancellor at the University of Texas, Austin. And the Texas state legislature was debating campus carry. This had actually been uh, up for debate for a couple of years at that point in the state of Texas. Uh, There had been one legislative attempt to uh, get campus carry on the books. It did not pass. Texas's legislature meets every other year for a period of 140 days, so it uh, came back up again in 2015. This time it looked like they had the votes, but there was fierce lobbying in opposition to campus carry, and a lot of that opposition came from William McRaven. Yeah, this is a uh, piece in the Texas Tribune from uh, January of 2015. McRaven, campus carry would create a less safe environment. That was his objection. Should be noted, by the way, that the uh, head of the Texas A&M system took a different stance and said, look, we we trust our students uh, on campus to be law-abiding, so why would we not anticipate or expect that those concealed carry holders would be just as law-abiding on campus as they are right now? Uh, William Raven took a completely different point of view. Uh, In his letter, cautioned that his opposition to campus carry stemmed from his concern for the safety of students, faculty, and staff. Said his office had received calls from those groups as well as law enforcement and mental health professionals raising concerns about campus carry. Went on to say there is great concern that the presence of handguns, even if limited to licensed individuals age 21 or older, will lead to an increase in accidental shootings and self-inflicted wounds. McGraven also cited concerns about allowing weapons in the university system's hospitals where emotions run high and laboratories where chemicals and high-tech equipment are in use. All right. By the way, campus carry is the law of the land in Texas. None of the concerns that William McGraven uh, mentioned have, have been justified. Campus carry has not been an issue in the Lone Star State of Texas. And right now, there are plenty, well, I don't know what the campus situation is like at UT Austin, but those who are on campus, perfectly entitled that they are concealed carry holders to carry uh, on uh, the campus and in the buildings there. But go back to something that McRaven said, quote, this is again, this is a quote by McRaven himself. This isn't a reporter putting words in his mouth. There's a great concern that the presence of. Of handguns, even if limited to licensed individuals age 21 or older, will lead to an increase in both accidental shootings and self-inflicted wounds. Now, that's an argument against handgun ownership. That's not just an argument against campus carry. That's an argument against handgun ownership. And I would say that that is an anti-Second Amendment point of view. 
Flash forward a few years. In the aftermath of the shootings at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, William McRaven again spoke out, not against knee-jerk gun control measures that would not have stopped that attack, but instead praising the uh, student gun control activists. And here's what he had to say. He said, uh, quote, I could not be prouder of them. This is exactly what we need the youth of America to do, to stand strong, to stand together, to challenge the laws that have not served them well. Now, again, we've spoken with Ryan Petty on this program before. We've spoken with Andrew Pollack on this program before. Individuals who lost their children in the attack at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. And they have pointed out the failures that led to that attack were, were not failures of the Second Amendment. They were failures of law enforcement in the school district. There had been plenty of warnings. There had been multiple trips by law enforcement to that assailant's home. There was a, a report called into the FBI two days before the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School warning of an attack. And the FBI never referred that call to the Miami field office. We know, again, of the failures of the Broward County Sheriff's Office. School resource officers who stood outside the building and shots were fired inside. We know about these failures. And instead, William McRaven said, yeah, you know what we need? More gun control. Now, listen, this again is a common statement on the part of gun control activists and gun control advocates. I support the Second Amendment, but. There's always a but. And unfortunately, the media never wants to press these folks. I would like to ask this question to Admiral William McRaven. Since you say you're a Second Amendment supporter, can you give me an example of one gun control law on the books that you believe goes too far? Since you are a Second Amendment supporter, can you tell me, what do you think about Joe Biden's plan to ban the most commonly sold centerfire rifles in America today, to ban the most commonly owned ammunition magazines in the country today, to require Americans who lawfully possess these items to turn them over to the federal government in exchange for some undefined cash stipend, or pay $200 per item? with the promise that they can maintain possession of those firearms. And what do you think, Admiral, about the idea that anybody who does not do so, who doesn't turn their guns over, who doesn't register their magazine under the National Firearms Act, would be subject to 10 years in federal prison if they are uh, convicted of maintaining possession of the guns and the magazines that they already own? Because I don't know, honestly, how any Second Amendment supporter could look at Joe Biden and Kamala Harris's gun control plan and say, yeah, I can get behind that. If Admiral McRaven wants to support Joe Biden, as he clearly does, that's fine. It's his right as an American to do so. But don't lie to the American people about your views. And don't lie to the American people about Joe Biden's views either. Because the truth of the matter is, Kamala Harris, as we've talked about in this program before, signed on to an amicus brief when the Supreme Court was debating whether or not the Second Amendment actually did protect an individual right to keep their arms, and she aligned with the group that said, no, it does not, that it only protects a, some sort of collective right to join a militia. Joe Biden himself describes the Second Amendment as, quote, limited on his campaign website, but has never been asked by anybody in the press what exactly that means. Again, we want honesty from our elected officials. We want them to level with us. I would rather have Joe Biden stand up and tell the American people, look, I really don't think the Second Amendment is a real right. I don't think it's a fundamental right. I don't think it's an individual right. And I don't see it as a barrier to enact my gun control policies. It wouldn't make me vote for him. Might make me respect him a little bit more. And if Admiral William McGraven would say the same thing, might have a little more respect for him too. I respect his service. I respect his sacrifices in defense of this nation. 
But I don't respect lying to the American people about what support for the Second Amendment actually looks like. And sadly, I think that's exactly what Admiral William McRaven has done. He's not alone. You got sportsmen and sportswomen for Biden. Yeah, that uh, talk about the Second Amendment as it relates to hunting and sporting, but doesn't mention self-defense. You got all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, Democrats running for office like Mark Kelly, co-founder of the gun control group Giffords, (laughs) proclaiming he, too, is some sort of Second Amendment supporter. The number one question that that, that any reporter should ask any politician or any campaign surrogate when they say, I support the Second Amendment, but I'm just in favor of these common sense gun safety laws. The very first question that should be asked is, "Okay, you support the Second Amendment. What's an example of a gun control law that would violate the Second Amendment? That's not a gotcha question. It's not. It's a fair question. But that question will never be asked. Unfortunately, you know, too many members of the media completely uncurious about what the answer might be. Uh, And those that aren't curious, I think they know what the answer would be. And they don't want to call attention to the lie. To the emptiness of that phrase. I support the Second Amendment. But. All right. Let's turn our attention now to our uh, good deed of the day, our recidivist report, our uh, armed citizen story. We're going to start with our recidivist report. Uh, speaking of campus carry, case out of South Carolina where a, a man is pleaded guilty in connection with a shooting at South Carolina State University. And uh, you're not going to be happy with the sentence that this young man's received. According to the TND.com, uh, 23-year-old Joshua Breon Jarrett Collier pleaded guilty last month to first-degree assault and battery, assault and battery of a high and aggravated nature, as well as carrying a weapon on school property. And he was sentenced by Circuit Judge Ed Dixon under the Youthful Offender Act, though the dude is 23, which last time I checked makes you a grown-ass man. Circuit Judge Ed Dixon sentenced uh, Collier to no more than three years in prison and then immediately suspended that prison sentence and uh, substituted two years of probation instead. Yeah. September 20th, 2019. A South Carolina State student, a Claflin University student, injured when Collier opened fire near a Building K of the Hugen Suites Housing Complex, which is a, a co-ed dorm for upperclassmen there at South Carolina State. Again, he shot and wounded two students. The shooting stemmed, according to authorities, from an off-campus dispute. And in exchange for shooting two people on a college campus, Collier got two years probation. Unreal. Unreal. By the way, this was not Collier's first run-in with the law. In May of 2018, Collier had pleaded guilty to first offense, third-degree burglary. A judge sentenced him under the Youthful Offender Act not to exceed five years. He did no years in prison. Also in 2018, Orangeburg, uh, South Carolina Department of Public Safety officers charged Collier with possession of a stolen pistol. Yeah, unlawful carrying of a pistol. First-degree possession of a controlled substance. Court records show that he did not appear for scheduled hearings related to those charges, basically ducked out. Prosecutors ultimately uh, dropped those charges, though, when he pleaded guilty to the shooting and was sentenced to probation. You know, there are probably a lot of gun control advocates in South Carolina who are advocating for all kinds of new gun laws. I would say when a man with a previous criminal history can shoot two students on the uh, campus, of South Carolina State, and not only walk away with probation for that case, but have charges dismissed in other weapons cases, we've got a problem with failing to fully enforce the existing laws on the books. We don't have a problem with a lack of gun control laws in the state of South Carolina. But Joshua Breon, Jarrett Taylor, or excuse me, Jarrett Collier, 23 years of age, still a youthful offender, I was married. I was a stepdad when I was 23, but no, Joshua, he's a youthful offender. He is the subject of today's recidivist report. (sighs) Can you tell I'm a little steamed by that one? I'm a little steamed by that one. 
Let's get to our armed citizen story. This might make me feel a little bit better. That gentleman right there, Michael Snyder, a homeowner in Pennsylvania who was able to defend himself after a uh, guy tried to break into his home in Paradise Township, PA. Yeah, you'd think that they wouldn't have troubles like this in uh, Paradise. There's Michael Snyder. But uh, apparently even in Paradise, you got to worry about home invaders. So this happened a couple of days ago. Uh, State police in Stroudsburg, PA, say the intruder was under the influence of drugs when he broke into the Paradise Township home around 4.45 Sunday afternoon. Michael Snyder, 72 years old, Vietnam War veteran, said he was able to keep his calm because of his time in the war. He said he was sitting in his chair in his living room. He saw a man outside, opened the door to talk to him. He said, uh, it didn't make a lot of sense. He said, would you please call the police? Please call the police. They're going to kill me. Snyder said, okay. State police said 38-year-old Queasy Scarrett of the Bronx was worried that a gang was after him. Michael Snyder said, listen, man, just wait outside. I'm going to call 911 for you, but you just, you just wait here. He said, I called state police, called 911, and I'm talking to them in the garage, and they hear this crash in the house. Yeah, apparently uh, Queasy Scarrett broke through a window into his home. Man didn't get any farther than that. Michael Snyder says, I had the pistol cocked and ready. And he was standing there in the kitchen. Scared, held a gunpoint by the 72-year-old Vietnam vet for 10 minutes until state police arrived. He said he was able to keep his composure because of his experience in the war. He said, when I come under fire, how will I react? Will it scare me to death? Will I be able to react? But yes, experience helps. He says, I was so happy yesterday I did not have to pull the trigger. I don't want to do that. No gun owner I know wakes up in the morning and thinks to themselves, man, I hope today is the day that I get to defend my life with my firearm. I know the gun control advocates like to assume that that's, you know, how gun control owner, how gun owners are, but I've, I've yet to meet one person who's really been enthused about the prospect of somebody breaking into their home and threatening their life. I know plenty of people who own a firearm because if that, ever happens, they want to be able to protect themselves, but I, the the idea of, you know, waking up in the morning and saying, man, I hope today's the day I get to use my gun against somebody, that's like waking up and saying, I hope today's the day my kitchen catches on fire and I get to use that fire extinguisher, I hope today's the day tree falls on my house, I get to see how my uh, homeowner's insurance policy works. No. A, a firearm in the home for self-defense is an insurance policy. And like Michael Snyder, I am very pleased that he did not have to pull the trigger either that he was able to hold uh, Scarrett until officers arrived. He was taken into custody. Scarrett was charged with criminal trespass, simple assault, as well as criminal mischief, taken to the Monroe County Correctional Facility on a $100,000 bond. And finally today, our good deed of the day, we will stay in Pennsylvania for this one. A uh, story from uh, Penn Live. Pennsylvania State Trooper saves a toddler from a runaway horse and buggy. Yep, this is a story from 2020. Not from, you know, 1920 or 1820. Happened in uh, Marionville, Pennsylvania, where a uh, state trooper saved a three-year-old girl uh, who was alone in a buggy when the attached horse started running. Trooper uh, jumped into action to save the little Amish girl during an incident that happened in Marionville, which is in Forest County. Uh, something that frightened the horse prompted to take off at a full gallop with the toddler still inside the buggy, which nearly tipped over. Trooper, though, able to stop the buggy, rescue the little girl. She is safe and sound. I'm glad to see that. We have a, uh, over the past couple of years, we've actually had a, a number of Amish families move into the Farmville, Virginia area from uh, the Lancaster, PA area, also from uh, Ohio. So I've become somewhat accustomed uh, to seeing the horse and buggies on the uh, road, uh, seeing them parked at the grocery store. And uh, I can tell you, I mean, I, you know, these, uh, that would be a scary moment uh, to uh, to see that buggy fly away with your three-year-old child inside, but in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing, that uh, Pennsylvania State Police Trooper, whose name, by the way, not uh, released publicly, but whoever that trooper was, we thank you for your very good deed. Now, that is about all the time we've got for you on this edition of Bearing Arms, Cam & Company. I want to thank you for being a part of the program as well. 
two weeks until Election Day. And uh, every day between now and then, I would encourage you as a Second Amendment supporter to do what you can uh, to be engaged, to be involved, not only in the presidential election, but at the uh, federal level in terms of, you know, congressional races. If you've got a Senate race where you live, you might have state legislative races. You may have local issues that are coming up. Now is not the time to be on the couch. Now is not the time to think to yourself, well, my vote doesn't really matter and my voice doesn't really matter. I can tell you it absolutely does. There are going to be so many close races. I mean, we've got, you know, battleground polls in a number of states showing it neck and neck between uh, Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Uh, We've got congressional races where Michael Bloomberg is now pouring millions more dollars to try to ensure that there is an anti-gun U.S. Senate. Same with state legislative races. We wrote about this at Bearing Arms yesterday, uh, where Michael Bloomberg dumping in about $5 million into six states, specifically targeting state legislative races, because he wants to flip the Texas State House. He wants to flip the Ohio, or excuse me, the Iowa legislature. He wants to uh, make inroads in North Carolina. Basically wants to do to these states what gun control advocates were able to do in Virginia in 2019 to turn a pro-gun legislative body into an anti-gun tool of gun control activists. And I can tell you, if they're successful in doing so, they're not going to wait until 2021 or 2022 to start passing their local gun control laws. They will work almost immediately. That was the top priority in Virginia when Democrats took control of the state legislature in 2019, and it will be a top goal of any anti-gun lawmaker who's elected with the help of Michael Bloomberg on November the 3rd. So again, if you're a Second Amendment supporter, we've got a lot of work to do in the last two weeks. Uh, If you're looking for somewhere, some sort of guidance to help you, uh, to help direct you, I will remind you again, NRA ILA has their Political Victory Fund. Second Amendment Foundation has their Second Amendment First Responders. Uh, You can find out more about those organizations, nrapvf.org and SAF. Dot O-R-G. All right. We will be back tomorrow with more of the latest Second Amendment news from across the nation. Until then, don't forget, you can subscribe to Town Hall Media on YouTube. That way you'll never miss a program. You can also subscribe to Bearing Arms Cam and Company on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, you know, the normal podcasting platforms. You'll find us there. Townhall.com's podcast page as well. Have a great rest of your 2A Tuesday. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Until then, be well. Be safe, be free, and we'll see you soon with another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company.